Hi, you're listening to another AGB podcast. Today, I'm sitting down with Jeffrey Williams, CEO of Barcats, who's based in Australia. Barcats is a hospitality job platform that connects employers with those looking for work in the hospitality industry. Um, Jeffrey has also been actively involved with industry and governments in solving one of the worst hospitality staff shortages in our recent history. Hey, Jeffrey, welcome. Do you mind just starting off with a bit of background about your company and where you're from? Yeah, no drivers at all. Thank you. Um, so Barcats, uh, we, I created Barcats about three and a half, nearly four years ago now. Um, and it was all around how do we connect staff to venues and venues to staff, specifically in hospitality. Um, we work with uh, 24,000 venues across Australia and New Zealand, everybody from Crown Casino through to little cafes and restaurants, clubs. Um, we uh, work um, with nearly 94,000 uh, staff looking for work um, on a daily basis. Um, we've just been, you know, COVID hasn't really taken a dent out of us. We've just flown uh, during that period. Um, some of the things that we've certainly noticed during COVID is that, um, and we work closely with both federal governments in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the Australian figures certainly are that 114,000 skilled labour left the country, and they are the chefs, the managers, the baristas that have gone back to their home countries of Brazil and Germany and the UK and, and Asia and so forth. On top of that, there's 147,000 less backpackers floating through um, the country um, that would also normally pick up the casual work. So collectively, there's about a quarter of the staff that are not available that I did that were available last February. So I'm now reopening. I'm now busy, but a quarter of the staff aren't there, um, and that's basically the gap that we that we're seeing. We're working really hard at the moment with the Fed government in, um, to really drive both. Um, mature age workers back into the industry. So people that have either started off as hospitality staff members, but how do I get back in? Um, um, we're working with companies like Qantas and Virgin who have let a lot of staff go, um, but they're actually really good hospitality staff members. How do we retrain and give them some confidence? So we've been running a course called Job Ready, which is a, 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 a course we're totally sponsoring. So there's no cost to the individual um, to get them their latest RSA, the responsible serve of alcohol, the latest uh, RCG, and the basics of how to pull a pint, take an order, carry three plates, occupational health and safety, dealing with COVID, some of those things. Um, and that's been super successful and actually then landing people jobs with a little bit of confidence. We've also been focusing heavily on, on basically uh, youth unemployment or just youth. How do we get uh, hospitality to be more excited about the pathway? Mm. Hospitality in the past has been seen as a well going pre-covid hospitality we already had workers within hospitality um suffer anxiety 64 percent of people we interview would say that they were um, suffering from some form of anxiety um working within hospitality whether it be shortage of shifts whether it be working nights whether it be sporadic sort of working and mm. arrangements um fair pay conditions all of those sorts of things during covid that spiked to 92 percent yeah so, wow. It's an industry that's actually, oh, am I going to be able to get enough work next week? The insecurity of, of my workplace. Um, mm. And that's definitely taken a dent of why actually we're rebuilding a bit of, a bit of uh, enthusiasm and confidence back into the hospitality community. And, yes. and ultimately, yeah, sorry. So I was going to say, so it sounds like a, a multi-pronged sort of reason why there is such a shortage, because you mentioned that uh, the foreign workers not being here uh, and not manning those positions. I mean, that's something that we can't really change, obviously, until this sure, corona fire yeah. situation is controlled and borders are opened up again, right? But to yeah. try and get Australians to come back um, or, or to enter the industry if they haven't been in before, there's a few barriers that's stopping them. And, and you mentioned there, um, there's a, a sort of an image problem in hospitality. Is that right? Yep. Could you, could you yeah, go definitely. a little bit further into that image problem? Yeah, certainly. The, the image problem is, is, is a few things. Firstly, um, it's hard work, hospitality. It's a, um, you know, it's um, if you're a chef or a kitchen hand, you're working in darkened rooms, split shifts, um, uh, long hours on your feet. Um, so um, we're really working hard with venues to talk about, actually think about that full-time role. How do you split that role into maybe two or three jobs rather than one job? Um, because actually an over 45 or a 50 year old doesn't want to spend 40 hours on their feet uh, working, mm. but they definitely do 20. And hey, that barista job that can start at nine and go through to three is perfect for a working mum. So how do we, how do we get, how do we get a, a school mum into that job? 
Um, how do we just think creatively about the types of jobs that that historically we just would have thought about in a single a single way? Yeah. Um, the, the other the other issues are obviously for for the pre COVID we we had a number of instances where uh, venues were underpaying staff members. Um, there was a perception of um, of uh, wage theft from from the uh, from the staff member, um, mm. and as a result, you know we've again been working heavily with Fair Work uh, around better clarity around what award wages are, what should be being paid, and working with venues around just getting better clarity around at what uh, at what different times what different triggers actually you should be changing your award wages uh, mm. and so forth um the uh, the other thing i think that uh, certainly um the industry suffers to a certain degree is just the amount of transient nature of it that actually it's it's constantly moving so you know this week the sun's out in sydney it's been a great week for sales Tomorrow, next week, it rains and, and actually sails full through the window. You know, mm. you know so how, the floor, I should say. So it's really trying to trying to get better flexibility mm. um, into your into your rostering, better flexibility into into how do I, um, you know, match staff members that can work flexible to venues that actually can be more flexible in, in their approaches. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a, there's sort of another um, area that I wanted to explore, which was. Uh, uh, and just in some of the conversations I've had with the, the club operators, the fact that uh, staff, and not just in hospitality, but you know the, the gaming floor staff as well, um, there's sort of a feeling that there's not much of a, a upwards career path um, from from where they stand. You know, and, and uh, what yep. what have you been seeing in, in that regard? I, I think that is really changing, and certainly the more progressive club managers, club CEOs. Um, but also venue, you know, we work with Australian Venue Company, which is one of the biggest in Australia, 170 odd venues, um, largely running big gaming venues. Um, they've just released a new program called Bamboo, and it's all about career progression. And it's this whole thought of Bamboo takes 18 months to grow, you know, mm. it's about building a foundation, and then, then you see it really fly. Um, they see uh, the opportunity of building assistant managers and venue managers from their base, but actually how do they really build capability and skill set at that base? Um, more and more venues uh, are needing to invest in this sort of uh, way of thinking because mm. it was so easy in the past of, I had hundreds of people to choose from. Well, those hundreds of people aren't there anymore. So you've got to start vetting and training. And um, what we're seeing is with the government programs as well around traineeships and apprenticeships, the access to more, better funding we're certainly seeing a lot more of that occur. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it's still a really slow process because like Bamboo, it's a, it's a two and a half year, you know, to put somebody through an apprenticeship or a traineeship, you're not going to see the, the, the fruits of that for a couple of years. Mm. And the issue that most of the clubs are suffering at the moment or most venues are, but I need somebody to fill the shit, you know, fill the kitchen now. And, yeah. and there's a real gap. So the only way to do that is by bringing, Ex, ex hospital staff back in and yeah. trying to excite them. Alternatively, what we're seeing is wage increases. So we're seeing cost cost of uh, cost of doing business going up roughly fifteen to twenty percent mm. because there's a shortage of chefs out there. Uh, yeah, and and just on that, I find it quite interesting because you know back during um, COVID when we had job keeper, job seeker, uh, you know you could understand that there were some people who were there was a lack of willingness to come into the industry because they're kind of you know they're, they're kind of getting paid you know to to sit at home money. right. But with yeah. it now ending as of last month, uh, I would have imagined that it, the issue would sort itself, but it, it seems to still be a, a problem, and it's it's seen as a problem that will continue for at least the next year. Um, do you have uh, some insights on? why that is you know some people in the industry were talking oh there'll be a hundred thousand people coming back into the marketplace come the fifth of the fifth of march yeah it just hasn't happened but it's because i think they were already deployed in the system they were just being paid double double if you like um, right yeah um, so they never so they never left and so they're they still there left. yeah yeah 100 percent. Mm. and i think instead what we're seeing is um, I think there's probably 15 to 20% of venues will shut over the next three to four months. I think yeah. there is real pressure on, on um, without those subsidies and we're, we still don't have international travel. We don't have, you know, business returning at a rate of knots. Those venues that have been holding on with their fingertips will, will close and consolidate. That potentially may well free up some staff members, 
but it's also going to it's also going to uh, um, cause a fair bit more anxiety as well as venues are shutting um, and so forth, and, and this consolidation mm. happens. Um, yeah, sounds like the um, that roller coaster ride is still not over. So we're we're, we're in for some um, you know tops and turns uh, over the next few months, right? We've we've got venues in in Circular Key, for instance, that are still only running at 30 percent of what they were doing pre COVID, mm. and that's that's largely because well they used to have a cruise ship that turned up every every afternoon. There'd be six thousand people get off. They'd walk yep. around. They'd have two drinks. They'd walk back onto the cruise ship. Then you'd have all the people coming from the CBD would flush down into Circular Key and there'd be a buzz. That's mm. just not there at the moment. So until that really comes back, you know, mm. guys are holding on with their fingertips. They really are. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for your time, Jeffrey. I really appreciate it. Um, and the insights into what's going to be happening with the hospitality industry in the months ahead. I, I look forward to seeing where your company takes us. Thanks very much, Felix. Have, uh, have a great day. I look forward to uh, catching up soon. Thank you.